welcome everybody to our seminar. So today's speaker is Joel Merker and he will give his third lecture on symmetries with power series. Okay, so I'm very glad to be invited in this great group because it's about league groups, etc. So, okay, so I repeat that I'm very happy that Pavel Nurovsky called, came to, to Paris three years ago and we have good contacts and he just, just gave me his enthusiasm. So I'm very happy. Okay, so now I try to do, because I completely apologize for last time. So I, I tried to do something extremely simple, which was just part of what I said last time. And uh, this will be done with details, okay? So I will take my time. So I will not cover many topics. I will just like review the method I want to develop. So of course, Boris Dubrov, uh, who is present, will you say just, it's just very easy for him. So I apologize to him. So I tried to describe what the power series method, method can give uh, with a simple case, which I like worked a lot of times already. So I'm speaking about a finally homogeneous. So essentially the idea is it's the same for more complicated structures. That, that's my message. So I want to just describe in details how it works for a simple case, which is representative of what is done in other cases. So I'm looking at a finally homogeneous parabolic surfaces in R3. It could be in C3. It would be the same for this parabolic case. So what, what do I mean by parabolic? I mean that the Hessian is of constant rank one and not two. So I'm taking coordinates X, Y, U in the left space and R, S, V in the right space. And I'm taking an affine transformation, which if I choose two points left and on the right to be the origin becomes a simple GL3 transformation. So it's just a linear transformation which fixes the origin with a certain determinant three by three matrix, which is non-vanishing because it should be a group, okay? So the first surface is a graph, U, a function of X, Y, which passes through the origin, which means that F of zero, zero is equal to zero. And V is equal to G of R, S with, of course, g of zero, zero, also equal to zero. And as the title uh, says, I'm looking at convergent power series expansions. In fact, I will only look at certain number of order, which is like about nine, not, not more than nine, it's sufficient. But a posteriori, because we know that all transitive Lie group actions by Montgomery and Gleason can be equipped with a real analytic structure, it is no restriction to assume from the beginning that the power series are analytic. Hence, they have a positive radius of convergence. So I'm taking F, F, G, K, X, I over factorial of I, Y, G over factorial of G, and G the same with the coordinates R, S. There is a reason why I put factorial here is that when you interpret these coefficients in terms of differential invariance, it is necessary to put a factorial to have a good correspondence. However, for what I'm doing today, I, would, I could have like dropped the factorials without trouble. Okay, but we, we, we keep the factorials. So the main point is the following. So if you have such a linear map, GL3, which sends a first surface to the right surface V equal G, you have to say that a certain point X, Y, U is mapped to a certain point R, S, V on the target surface. And this expresses by saying that Minus V, V is what? V is C1X plus C2Y plus DU. So minus V plus G should be zero because V equal G is equivalent to minus V plus G equals zero. And then in G, you have to replace R and S, which are given by these formulas, okay? So you replace, okay? 
So it's A11X plus A12Y plus B1U. But look, you have to restrict to the hypersurface on the left. So you have to replace U by F of XY, that's all. And then because X and Y are coordinates on your surface, this equation should be identically satisfied whatever values you give to X and Y. So this means that as a power series, it is identically satisfied in X and Y. This is the fundamental equation. And in a sense, everything about constructing homogeneous models, et cetera, constructing the algebras of differential invariants where you don't deal with homogeneous models, everything should come and will come from this little elementary equation FG. That's all. And that what is funny is that the same occurs for a lot, a lot of more complicated geometric structures. So today I decided to do something very elementary. So I'm just looking at this case in dimension two so that to explain all the ideas. So ek FG, when you expand in power series of X and Y should be a sum I G in N X I Y G times certain coefficients C I G, which depend on what? First, on the coefficients of the three by three matrix, of course, and also on the Taylor coefficients of F and G. And the dependence the explicit formulas might be complicated a bit. And the core of the method is to compute these coefficients, C, I, G, and to analyze their vanishing because they should vanish. So if a power series vanishes identically, this means that, that all its coefficients should vanish identically. And I have a notation to say that the coefficient of X F G of the X I Y G, this is a standard notation to say coefficient of with these brackets. It's not only bracket, but it is also a standard notation in people dealing with uh, combinatorics of series. And this is exactly what I denoted above C I G in calligraphic characters. So they should be vanishing. And we should compute them and play with them, like compute with them, replace with them, solve with them, etc. But instead of this like heavy notation X, Y, Y, G, X, F, G, it is like a, a, a equivalent to say, to just put in green, this is green. If you don't see it well, this is green here. So just above the equal sign, okay? And this is the notation I will have in this uh, very, very elementary talk today. And we will proceed inductively order by order when the order is the sum i plus g. Okay, and this is also characteristic of all the other structures I touched since the last two years. First of all, when you have a surface in R3, it has a tangent plane as the origin. And it's obvious that by some affine, even Euclidean transformation, you can make the horizontal plane tangent horizontal, the tangent plane to be horizontal. This is obvious. So equivalently, this means that you can normalize the first order terms for free, essentially. So this means that the power series starts only with order two terms in X and Y. And similarly, V should be zero plus a second order term in RS. So don't be afraid. I said that today I will do something for babies like me. So I will do something very elementary. So you will essentially understand everything now we, because I will take my time, etc. And next, and this is really a method of equivalence because we have two ends, the left end which is u equal f of x, y, and the right end, which is v is equal to g of r, s. And there is a map, which is a linear map, because we started with affine equivalence, but we fixed the origin. And now what do we do? We want to express the stability group 
of this obvious normalization that the tangent place is horizontal. By this, I mean that I want to say what is the group reduction of this matrix, three by three matrix here I started with, which is invertible, of course. So I put in green here an exponent zero that you see. You see this exponent in green. I like green, okay? But I'm not doing green washing in this talk, which is just to fix the origin. So there is no translational constants because I assume that I already fixed the point. But now I assume more. I want to understand what it means to fix the horizontal tangent plane. But it's very easy. It is done. It is fixed if and only if the coefficient c1 is equal to 0 and the coefficient c2 is equal to 0, which is like you can view it without computation if you are just think a bit. But here is a computation. This is a proof here. We just read the fundamental equation ek fg that I started with. Remember this. And if I read this equation, look, as I said, f of xy is an O of two. It's all, only order two terms. And g is order two terms in r and s. But because this expression is of order one in x and y, and this expression is also of order one in x and y, the composition g of this is of order two in x and y. So this means that this disappears, modulo of order two, order two, and this also disappears, modulo order two. So this means that it remains only at order one, these two terms. And I said that this equation fg should be identically satisfied for my affine map to send my first surface to the other surface. And therefore I deduce that C1 should be zero and C2 should be zero. And this is the proof. So more precisely, using my notation IG above the equal sign, I see that zero is equal to the coefficient of X power one, Y power zero, of the fundamental equation ek fg. And as I showed you, this is minus c1. Remember this. It was minus c1 here. And now, next, the coefficient of y power 1 is minus c2. So I need these two coefficients to vanish so that I stabilize the horizontal tangent planes from left to right. So, next. We pass to order two, possibly after rotation in the X, Y space, and also similarly in the target right R, S space, I said to you that parabolic surface means to me it's constant Hessian rank one. And I rapidly said in the first lecture, but this is, this is this long paper on archive, which is already accepted for publication, which dealt with hypersurfaces in Rn plus one of any dimension of constant Hessian rank one. And in the first sections of this paper, it is really very cleanly proved that the Hessian is an affine invariant, especially the rank of the Hessian matrix is an affine invariant. So now in this talk, to make something very elementary, so that some, I hope, many people understand much of what I'm saying. I'm just doing something completely orthogonal from the second Greek lecture. I want to do something easy to understand, not covering many topics, very basic, very down to earth. So I assume that the Asian rank one Holds. So this means that the Asian matrix of F should be of determinant zero, but not identically zero. Otherwise, it would be of Asian rank equal to zero. So I assume that it is of rank one. So there should be some entry among the four entries, which is non-zero. But as I just said, after some rotation in the XY space, 
it is easy to realize that I can manage so that this is this entry which is non-vanishing at the origin. In summary, the constant Hessian rank one hypothesis means the following. First, the Hessian determinant vanishes identically. And secondly, Fxx is non-zero. I don't say not identically zero. I say constant Hessian rank one, which means that it is non-zero at the origin. And as I just said, the wrong properties of the Hessian are, are finally invariant. This is like something very classical. And it is known then that it is equivalent to the fact that the Hessian of, rank, of G is also a Frank one. And after a rotation in the RS space, I can manage to have the, exactly the parallel assumption about G. And next. So at order two, okay, we have two quadrics, quadratic terms, okay? And I remember that today I will put some factorial in the denominators, okay? So this is two factorial, in fact. And then um, the same for G. So they are just quadratic forms and it's very easy. It goes back to 4,000 years uh, ago. It was Babylonian mathematics, which understood that that you can like make some square appearing and then you make a change of coordinate in the X space, uh, X, Y space and a change of coordinate in the R, S space and you come to this normalization U equal a constant here, here that you drop the constant by dil dilation which is, which is still something affine, even linear. And then it is extremely easy to normalize the two surfaces to be so looking that u equal x square of two plus an o of three and v similarly equal to r square of two plus an o of three. And now, since I have normalized the two surfaces from the left and from the right in a similar way, I need to express the stability group of this normalization. It is rather close to what Carton is doing, in fact. And as far as I know, in the literature that I, uh, I am aware of, the literature of people playing with power series method of equivalent, which are much less people than people handling Carton's method of equivalence and Carton connections, as far as I know, there is no real like emphasis or like uh, characterization of this group production. And it is because I played with Carton's method and also because Pavel Nurovsky taught me a lot about it, that I somehow naturally transferred these uh, ideas of group production to this context. Okay, so now I say that what is the stability group of this normalization up to order two? This is a proposition it holds if and only if A12 is equal to zero and D is equal to A1 square. So I start with the group, subgroup of GL3, which is a stability group for the normalizations of order one. And I say that there is a group reduction with, with this squ 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 squirrel arrow, which transfers this to the subgroup with two group parameters normalized. And I don't give the details, but I say proof, it's little exercise. I say that the first assertion that you can put it in this form, just reduction of quadratic form of rank one, which is extremely elementary. And the second assertion about group reduction, it is the same. You look at the fundamental equation EC FG, and you look at coefficient of x square, coefficient of x, y, coefficient of y square, and you realize that to make these equations to be satisfied, it is necessary and sufficient to put a12 equal zero and d equal a1 square. Don't be afraid. In the next part of the lecture, I will show you similar equations that I did not show here. I don't remember why. 
So now, I just re recall you, but it was not easy to like follow in a general dimensional case. All this, in fact, was reviewed uh, too quickly, I guess, in lecture one. So it is proven even for something of dimension n in n plus one, in any dimension. So now what? Once we have normalized all second order monomials, by the way, I would like to mention that with this method, like one year and a half ago in 15 days, I was able to redo everything of the complete classification in the non-degenerate case and in the degenerate case, which was done firstly by Boris Dubrov, Komrakov, and Rabinovich, and also a bit later by Eastwood and Ejov. But I was also able with this method to treat the non-degenerate case and also other cases. For instance, surfaces in C4, except one branch. So here I chose this very elementary thing because there is no a little less complexity that, than in the non-degenerate case. So now, in comparison to the non-degenerate case, we assume that the Hessian is of rank one instead of two, and there will be consequences. Uh, be before I try to let you know what's happening, because there is some deep thing behind, which is like uh, universal also. I tell you that once everything is done for order two terms, it's natural to look at other three terms. That's just induction on the order. So just for fun, I just put all other three terms, okay? And I just look, said, said to myself that other four terms, et cetera, order five, it's not the time to look at them. So I just neglect them. Then I say that the Asian rank one Assumption here implies, so I leave it as a little exercise, but I will just do the exercise because I'm talking. It implies that this Taylor coefficient f12 is in fact zero, that this coefficient f03 is in fact zero, and of course the same, completely the same, also about this Taylor coefficient of g and this Taylor coefficient of g. So let us do the exercise. So Remember what I do assume. Now, first, the assumption that fxx is non zero is already finished because I know that x squared over two, it has fxx equal to one as the origin. So this assumption I can, I can forget from now. But there is the assumption the constant Hessian rank one that this determinant vanishes identically. So if I plug in f in this determinant, I differentiate twice. And if I compute the determinant, then I realize that for it to be vanishing at order two, in fact, then it is necessary and sufficient that these two Cotella coefficients vanish. So this is the solution to the exercise. So just I summarize, I just plug this Taylor series in the two by two determinant, I expand the determinant, I look at what it gives, modulo the fact that I should not have any interference with the order four terms, and I deduce that these two Taylor coefficients do vanish. Therefore, it remains only two Taylor coefficients F30 and F21 in the third order terms of F. And similarly, it remains only two Taylor coefficients in G, the same, because there will be always a complete parallel. In fact, we are speaking about a method of equivalence. And as far as I know, because I manipulated this during 10 years of my life, in Carton's method of equivalence, rapidly, you forget about the fact that there should be two objects. And you construct a bundle, which sometimes, in fact, often is a Cartan connection. And you are happy with this, with just one object, one geometric object, and its bundle. You somehow forget from the beginning. And then at the end of the process, when you explore the branches, what do you get? You get possible Maurer Cartan equations of the homogeneous models. 
And from this Lie algebraic data, you reconstitute the model in coordinates by integration of these Lie algebras. In the method of equivalence I'm speaking of, there will be always the two objects present in our mind. They will be always present and we will be always playing with the two objects. So there will be really an equivalence between the two objects from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. And of course, it will be always parallel. Every normalization that you can do for a geometric object, you can restart and redo the same normalization for the right object, of course. And now I'm saying, now start the real work. Because order two terms is too easy, everybody knows. I, I, I said that today I'm doing something for babies. So don't be afraid that it's too simple. So the fundamental equation EK FG. So this now I'm playing with a computer, but to save time, I don't open Maple, maybe at the end if I have time. So I just make a little program. I, I, I plug in this little program this. I ask the computer to tell me what is EK FG. And I tell the computer to tell me what is this coefficient CIG here, which is, and usually I put the IG above the equal sign. So I don't do it by hand. In fact, I do it by hand on a computer. So anyway, I do it by hand in a sense. So now, if I look at the coefficient of X cube Y power zero in this X FG, this is what the computer gives, gives to me. It gives me something like, I should have done the same for all the two terms, but because it's too, too elementary and too well-known, I did not do it in the proper way. So now I'm doing everything in the proper way from all the three. And the second equation is the coefficient of x power two, y power one in the x fg. And it is this. So I'm, I'm preferring to tell you about this coefficient because it's simpler. How do you read this? There is one way of reading this equation which tells me, oh, this equation tells me that G21 can be solved in terms of F21. So it tells me that if I do a linear with such a matrix with the reduction to order two here, the matrix on the right, it tells me is that if I elect act this matrix on the left surface, then the Taylor coefficient of the right surface G21 is equal to F21 over A22 because there is A11 square which disappears. So I repeat, one way of understanding this question tells me that G21 expresses in terms of F21 and in terms of the affine transformation also. This is absolutely obvious, but it's not the right way to look at this equation. The right way to look at this equation is to say that G21 is a non-zero multiple of F21. And therefore, because A22 is non-zero, why A22 is non-zero is because look, the determinant of this, it is not triangular, but there is a block, two by two block, and there is zero, zero. When you expand in terms of, of the third colon, you see that the determinant of this matrix is a product of the terms on the diagonals. So it is A11 cube, A22. So because it is a subgroup of GL3, A11 and A22 should be non-zero. So this equation 2-1 should be interpreted by saying that G21 is a non-zero multiple of F21. This is very well known to express that G21 is a relative invariant. And now I can comment on the fact, uh, on the differences between Carton's approach and this like more down to earth approach. In Carton's approach, so there is the famous book of Guggenheimer that thanks to Boris Dubrov, I learned its existence. And in this book, there is a way to construct an invariant frame on the surface 
by some reduction. And this invariant frame is existing at every point of the surface. So it, it requires to introduce differential forms like in Carton's method of equivalence for infinite dimensional groups, like for Cauchy Riemann geometry, I played with this, or like for differential equation, Pavel Nurovsky played a lot with this. But what I'm saying here, so of course, in Carton's method of equivalence, you have a way to say that some curvature or some like single expression in the exterior differential system is a relative invariant. This you, you know, you know it very well, better than me. But what I am saying is that it's a, at the level of Taylor coefficient, the same story occurs at a more basic level. If you do really compare what's going on from Carton side and from the power series method of equivalence, you will realize that the G21 and the F21 are just the value of the origin of something that Carton necessarily encounters in his method. So there is a little bridge between the two methods that just says that Carton is stronger, of course, because he captures this in an invariant way at every point of the object. It's a bundle. And here, it's weaker. It's much weaker, in, in a sense because we capture the fact that something is invariant only at one point, the origin. But because it is weaker from the point of view of geometry, it happens to be stronger from the point of view of computational accessibility. And I will say a bit of not much today. I said already a, a lot last first lecture. Today, I will not insist much on that. So let us stop about rough comparisons with Carton's method and conclude that this little very elementary equation tells me that this Taylor coefficient, either it is zero in every system of coordinates or it is non-zero in every system of coordinates. Now I can go to the three point, the three zero equation. What does it tell me? It tells me something rather similar than what you deal with in Carton's method of equivalence. Remember, in black, so maybe I should augment the size of the characters, everything in red is something in the group which has been normalized. And in black, something which is still free. There are therefore five group parameters in this subgroup uh, participants can now see your screen. So just one moment. Is it okay? Uh, sorry. There was some cut. Uh, just, there was some cut of my talk or, or not? I think. No, there was not, not some cut, Katya? No, I think it is fine. Okay, so sorry, because I have some message. Uh, participants uh -huh. can see your screen which could have been said that uh, <laughs> I did not see my screen before, so, okay. So uh, as you realize, Katia, I'm rather like pedagogical, this I can do. Uh, so just drop this and share screen because, no, 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 no. What, what did I do? What did I do? No, I stopped share screen, so, so that's all. What did I do? What did I do sometimes? Uh, I don't share screen anymore, isn't it? No, you don't. Okay, now I can do, I think. Sometimes I don't know how to go back. I think now it's okay. So uh, F11, okay, okay, good, good. So now I said that I have, C, I still have five group parameters and B1 is among them. B1 is a freedom. So this equation, the three zero equation tells me that, in principle, it tells me this. It tells me that G three zero can be solved in terms of everything around it. But still there is B1, which is free. So I can choose B1 to somehow modify this equation. 
And then what do I do? Uh, so here is explanation that the determinant is non-zero implies that A22 is non-zero. So now I, I say to myself, I can normalize G3 zero to be zero. I can choose this Taylor coefficient to make it zero on the right surface by just saying that I kill all other terms thanks to the choice of B1. And it suffices to, to take B1 equal to this. So the zero is my choice of G3 zero equal zero. And then, uh, of course, I should replace G21 in terms of F21 to be completely, uh, co uh, to complete computationally. And therefore, I am happy because from the left, I had this F30, which is anything. And on the right surface, I, I, I could make G30 equal zero. So this means that on the right, I could kill this term. I'm happy because there is lots less complexity. But then it is obvious. The, and the method of equivalence is just you modify, modify, modify successively your surface to make it simpler, to normalize it, to somehow have less monomials and less freedom. And therefore, once I have normalized G3 zero, I can restart from the surface on the right, which is V equal G of RS with this G3 zero, but I can decide to replace this right surface on the left and to rename RSV as XYU, rename G to F. So I have U equal F with the G3 zero, which becomes F3 zero equal zero. And then I take another surface on the right, a third one, which I call V equal G of RS. And because of this reasoning I've just made, similarly to it, I can make its G3 zero to be zero. And therefore, without any work, we can assume simultaneously that F3 zero is zero and G3 zero also. This is what I told you. I really play with the two surfaces and I make usually all the same normalization on the left and on the right. So there is a principle or general principle which says that once a normalization has been made on the right, always, it can also be made exactly the same on the left, just by pure logic. And logic is the most easy part of mathematics. So the principle is the following, at any order, not only for order three, every performed normalization will always be instantly, immediately achieved on both hypersurfaces U equal F and V equal G. That's the general principle. Thus, U equal X square over two plus F21 X square Y over two plus zero. Remember F30 and F12, F03 were equal to zero plus other four terms, which I don't touch for the moment. And I have an equivalence to another surface V equal R square over two plus G21 R square S over two plus something of order four and higher that I don't want to consider for now. Since A11 and A22 are non-zero, the remaining equation, sorry, there is some zero missing here. I already discussed a lot with you that it means that G21 is a non-zero multiple of F21, which means that F21 is a relative invariant. And therefore, we are starting to construct our equivalence tree. So if we abbreviate root, like the root of the tree, essentially, but there are many roots in a tree, and it's just the, the starting point. I should have said start instead of root, I don't know. So fxx is non-zero, Hessian is identically zero, which I also can abbreviate fx, x non zero, h like Hessian of f identically zero. We must therefore open two branches. Because as I said, the, 
the, the property that F21 is vanishing is independent of coordinates, and that it is non vanishing is also independent of coordinates. So now I open two branches and I say to myself, what will happen? I don't know what will happen. So I have to walk. Always have to walk. Okay, so proposition if a surface S2 in R3, it could be in C3, it would be exactly the same proof, is a finally homogeneous and belongs to the branch F21 equals zero, so the, the, the top branch, then F depends only on X. It does not depend on Y. And the surface is a curve C power one, which is one dimensional, times just a, a dumb, like a free, like a R1, R power one in Y. So it's a cylinder. So just a product of a curve with R power one. And because we assume that the surface is a finally homogeneous, it's easy to convince oneself that the curve C1 in R2, now a curve in R2, not a surface in R3, is also a finally homogeneous. I want not to like completely classify this degenerate case. So I will not, it, it's not a completely straightforward corollary of the classification of curves. But today, I don't want to make it uh, like in details about this, even in the paper I'm writing. So to prove this proposition is important. And I will give you some idea, which is, in my opinion, something simple, but which was extremely important when I understood it one year and a half ago. Because before, what I will show you today, before I had meetings with Zhang Chen to express the consequences in the branch that F21 is identically zero, which was a consequence close to the spirit of Carton, which tells me that I should compute this differential invariant, relative differential invariant, and differentiate this differential invariant many times to express the consequences. And this was like, this had a, a cost, computationally speaking. It was like not non-trivial task to do that. And especially we joined with Dr. Chin Chen, we had a, another paper on the non-degenerate surface case in which we compute the differential invariants explicitly. And it's like more demanding because at some point, for instance, we have a differential invariant with a numerator with 36 differential monomials and in the paper, using a computer, of course, we had to differentiate these differential invariants four times. So after a while, there were hundreds of thousand terms in the numerator, but we managed to do it and to express the consequences because this is a branch assumption. F21 equals zero is a branch assumption. So it has consequences in the other branches of the tree. And as I said, if you work parametrically, and until, uh, until November 2020, I had no other idea except ex ex compute it explicitly. And today, I show you another idea, which is, in my opinion, extremely important. Although it is a baby, it's baby idea. And thanks to this idea, which I discovered only one year and a half ago, I could make a lot of progresses. Now, Remember, I had this FG, sorry, FG, which is just the equation FG, which expresses that the map goes to one surface to another surface. But this, I said, I said that it is a bit complicated to compute this uh, fucking coefficient here. And I can show you programs on computer. If you don't clean up order by order, this can be exploding in very rapidly. And there is a reason for that. Is it, it is because it is non-linear. G is a power series, and then when you truncate, it's a polynomial. When you expand, you, comp, you, 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 you compose a polynomial with such a thing, of course, it's, it's, it's big. But now what I will do is to follow the philosophy of Lee, really, which is somehow not 
really followed by Cartan's method, unfortunately. So this is my guess that by some clever like uh, enhancement of Cartan's method, you could like make it more accessible in the parametric way. I, I have no specific things to say. It's just an intuition. I did not try to do it already, not yet. But now what I will do is something which I master well since uh, more than 10 years. It is to express now that a general affine vector field like this. So it is uh, with affine coefficients. So again, it, you have 12 coefficients, but look, look, be careful here. I have not dropped the translational parameters because I want a homogeneous model. So I need at least two, three parameters this, for this to be homogeneous. So now I want to express that such a, a vector field is tangent to the surface u equal f of x, y. And it's very easy. You just apply L to the equation of the surface and you restrict to the surface and you should, you should get zero. So because the surface is horizontally parametrized by x and y coordinates, you should get an ek L, which is different from ek FG. But the idea is that ek L is just the infinitesimalization of ek FG. So it's just the like infinitesimal part. So ek L means that I should take a transformation from one surface to the other surface, which is epsilon close to the identity transformation. And therefore, uh, as is well known in Lie theory of partial differential equations, the computational complexity drops substantially. And we will see what's happening. So I continue to say that I should compute this as XL. So of course, I give it to a computer. And what is the good news is that this XL is particularly simpler than the XFG and particularly simple to, to manipulate because it is a, a, the infinitesimal philosophy of Lagrange and of, of Lee. So now with increasing orders mu equals zero, one, two, three, etc., I can reorganize XL order mu by order mu. So it means that I take I plus G, Y I plus G equal mu, and there will be a certain coefficient times X, Y, Y, G. And similarly, as for X, F, G, we will denote X, Y, Y, G of X, L to be, I take the same notation, C calligraphic, I, G. And shortly, I will also make an I, G above the equal sign. So I don't want to make a different notation. This is just clear from the context. Joel, Joel may I ask you something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, go, go. Uh, isn't it simpler? to give an explicit formula for f to one but uh, for taylor series not only at the origin but at any point near the origin yeah yeah you can do that yeah, yeah. This, uh, and to see in terms of f of x y and, and uh, to see that f of x y doesn't depend on y yeah yeah i agree with you you can do this this way yes so so you, you're quicker than me I will proceed in a way that I will reproduce this way in other contexts. But as just you say, Michael or Misha, I don't know what you prefer. Me, Misha, Misha. Misha, Misha. Uh, so you're true. It's, it's like good to express this F to one in terms of nearby points and to look quickly at the, at the consequence. In this case, F to one is just two terms. It's just two differential monomials. So it's, in this case, it's quicker. But for other deeper cases where the differential invariants are like 50 monomials, my experience that this method I'm, I'm showing is more, uh, is more tractable computation. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I understand that in this case, uh, maybe. Uh, no, no, in, in this case of, uh, of a possible general, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let, I, I said I'm doing something not for you, Misha, for babies, <laughs> for me. No, 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 it's... Uh, I'm doing something extremely basic. 
because last time I was doing too many things, it was not understandable. No, I you know I enjoy to understand everything because in many other lectures I understand. Uh, I think you follow everything I'm saying because for you it's completely well known. So, no, so no, now, it, is, it, it, it is nice. <laughs> so L is tangent to this. So I just uh, uh, compute on the computer L wow. of minus U plus F. And I extract the coefficient of X power zero, Y power zero, and I get uh -huh. minus T zero. Why? It's just because T zero is essentially something vertical. It's a vertical translation, but I want this to be tangent to a horizontal surface. It cannot be so. So T zero should be zero. This is, we could have expected this without computing. But what I say is that the L, so the tangency equation of L, gives me this geometric information computationally. And now I look at Taylor coefficient of x power one and y power zero of this L here, this tangency equation, and I get minus C1 plus T1 equals zero. And also I look at coefficient of x power zero, y power one, which is minus C2. So as I said, I don't, know what are the higher order terms at this, at this point. So I, I should not go further. If I go to L at order two, there will be some like something wrong because it depends on what's happening at order three. Now, this equation should be satisfied. So first I said that T zero should be zero, of course. This is clear, but now there is an ambiguity. What do I solve? Do I solve C1 equal T1 or do I solve T1 equal C1? And there is a simple answer. I should never, never, never of my life solve any of these two parameters, T1 and T2, why? Because they are the transitivity parameters. At the origin, look, at the origin, this vanishes, this vanishes, this vanishes, and I just said that T0 is also vanishing. So at the origin, L is T1 D over DX1 plus T2 D over DX2. And I said that the horizontal plan, pl tangent plane is horizontal. So this means that the tangent plane to the surface of the origin is along the X1 axis and along the X2 axis. It should be X and Y, sorry. Uh, I made a misprint here. It should be X and Y, sorry. Uh, it should be X and Y and also here, sorry. And so these two parameters T1 and T2 are representative of the fact that I am seeking, seeking a homogeneous model. So they should never be solved. So the key constraint of transitivity, local transitivity, local homogeneity requires that the span of dx dy, which is a tangent space at the origin of the surface, should be equal to the span at the origin of the vector field, which should be the span of t1 dx plus t2 dy. And therefore, t1 and t2 should be absolutely free in every computation, never, never solved. Otherwise, it would be about non-transitive models. And therefore, in this middle equation, there is only one choice is to solve C1 in terms of T1. There is no other choice. Next, we pass to order three. So U is equal to X squared over two plus F21 X squared Y over two plus, as I said, F30 can be normalized to be zero and F12 and F03 were zero by assumption of Hessian vanishing. And then what? A just little comment. When I'm looking at tangential vector field, it is as if I would have two surfaces, u equal f of x, y, v equal g of r, s, which are the same. So there is a, like an infinitesimal translation with, between essentially the same hypersurface, because if I comp compute the flow of the vector field, the map is identity plus epsilon times the vector field. And if I neglect the epsilon, this means that I have a map between the hypersurface itself. 
There are no two hypersurfaces, just one. So now, if I apply the vector field to this hypersurface, and I'm taking the XL fundamental equation, and I'm looking at the coefficient of x squared y power zero of x y of x power zero y power two, this is what I get. So this, this is just doable by hand, but I did it on the computer. First, the coefficient zero two is zero for three, and it's normal because I already take, took account of the fact that the Hessian is identically zero. We will discuss about this a bit later. Next, this is an equation that should be satisfied. Remember, all this equation I write should be killed, just should be uh, uh, disappearing. And now, as I said, I should never uh, uh, solve T1. So there is only one choice is to solve A12. And if we remember what we did in the case of FG, uh, remember at some point we saw little a one two. Remember it was little a one two equals zero. Okay, so there is a complete parallel. This is not written in the text, but in the files because I have like hundreds of files with this method. I always keep like a control of the of the rigor rigor of the computation by checking whether there is a complete parallel between ek fg and ek l and here here it's just an instance of the parallel and remember i just said to you that little a12 was solved to be equal to 0 and here big a12 is solved to be equal to minus f21 t1 aha why is it not equal to 0 it's because I said that when I'm looking at ek FG, I'm looking at a GL3 transformation fixing the origin. So there is no translational parameter because I'm just normalizing by looking at the isotropy group. So in this case, this means that T1 should be zero. And then I should have A12 equals zero if I moreover assume that I fix the origin. So there is a complete parallel between the two equations, provided I put T1 and T2 equal zero in L, and then you recover some parallel with FG. And more precisely, it's just the linearization of the identity of FG, which gives you L when you put T1 and T2 equal zero. However, you should of course not put T1 equal T2 equal zero, Always because you need a homogeneous model. You are seeking a homogeneous model. So now, similarly, instead of solving A11 by just thinking a bit, it's more natural to solve T. So I solve T and I put in the compute. So now remember the proposition that Misha was saying that he can do it like more efficiently. I completely agree. So suppose now that the F21 is vanishing, which is a relative invariant. And suppose, moreover, that it is a finally homogeneous. If you don't suppose that it is wrong, then f of x does not depend on y. OK, so now is the proof. And I like this proof because it's just elementary computational. So proof of this proportion. f to 1 is assumed, as I said. We are in this branch. So now we have to let Order four monomials appear, anything, all order four no monomials. And look, I put a zero in red to say that all the three monomials now are all zero because I said that only F21 remains, but I am in the branch when I say that I assume that F21 is equal to zero. So I emphasize that there are no other three terms. So, so there is just, just a gap in the power theory. And this is this gap will, which will be responsible of the fact that f depends not on y, or all, the, all this, these monomials, I will show that they vanish by a very simple argument, which requires much, much less computations than if I would have computed f to one explicitly, especially for other deeper invariants. So now, the equation when I said a12 is equal to, to this, if f to one is equal to zero, this is a12 equals zero. Now D, if F21 is equal to zero, it's zero plus two A11. 
So now I put this in the vector field here. So I put D, as I said, a, 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 a to one, I put them, and then I re recompute on computer the tangency equation with this order four non monomials. So I do it on the computer and I copy what the computer gives me. It gives me this, which is very funny. So I, I, I played with this in November two, 2020, one year and a half ago. And when I saw that I could just get consequences of this branch so easily, I was just incredibly like, just, just one, a big door was opening to me. It gives me this, the coefficient of x cubed, the coefficient of x square y, the coefficient of x y square, the coefficient of y cube is this. So there is first an equation in which, as I told you, b1, t1, and t2 are coefficients of the vector field. But I said that to have a transitive homogeneous model, I should not solve t1 and t2. So there is only one choice, is to solve for b1. But this is not what is interesting. What is interesting is this, is that I get three equations, the last three equations, in which there is only T1 and T2. Incredible. Only T1 and T2. So one option would have been to say that I plug these fourth order terms in the Hessian. This is what I did in all three. Look at the Hessian. I said at the beginning there was the Hessian. Uh, the Hessian is somewhere here. So I'm very slow because I'm explaining many things. I plug in this Hessian and I compute some Taylor coefficient. Remember, I said that you can deduce that F12, F03 is equal to zero. So this is one option. And this is the only option I saw when I was before November 2020. This was the only option in my mind. But now I'll show you another option, which is computationally much, much more effective in other branches, deeper in the branches, with the same general principle. So I say that now, by just by luck, I see three sort of very special equation where there is only T1 and T2 and should be satisfied. And then there is only one possibility to satisfy this equation is to say that this Taylor coefficient should be zero. Otherwise, it will be a linear relation between T1 and T2, which are transitivity parameters, and I'm seeking for homogeneous model. So necessarily, this should vanish. So I put them to zero without computing explicitly the Hessian even. So it's even deeper because I'm playing with the two points of view. I'm saying to you, you could, you could explicitly compute the differential invariance like Carton method parametrically gives you and then differentiate the, the, the invariance. But now I'm saying to you, no, 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 you don't need to do this anymore. You just need to apply the vector field. And in the equation you are obtaining those, which depends only on the tra transitivity parameters, will give you for free some constraints of the coefficient, which are absolutely equivalent to the ones you obtain by knowing the Hessian or the F21 parametrically. And it's very, very simple because as I know by experience since one year and a half, that this L is the most simple thing to deal with on computer and by hand. So you get difficult information with much, much less uh, computation than before. Therefore, so F04 should be zero, F13 but F13 is repeating itself. F22 should be zero, but F22 is repeating itself. F31 should be zero. So I get for free that these four Taylor coefficients vanish, I don't think, vanish at the origin, sorry. And if I do put this in the Hessian, I, I, I obtain exactly the same. Therefore, there remains only the R40. Here in this equation, just one remark. I said that B1 should be solved, but I should, but I should not deduce that F40 is zero, and I should not deduce, but I know already that F31 is zero, sorry. I should not deduce because there is some other group parameter in the infinitesimal 
Lie algebra, uh, sorry, uh, parameter. So in this equation, I should solve B1, I have absolutely no information on the values on the Taylor coefficient. But I repeat that the last three equations give you some precious information on the Taylor coefficient. And therefore, it remains only the R40, which is something simple. And now I let all the five terms appear. There are six, okay? And I play the same game. I make this equation in L tangent to U equal F here. I do this on a computer. So the echo L at order four gives what? It gives the coefficient of X4 is this. So once again, there is all, not only T1 and T2, there is only A11. And by the way, there is some like discussion between whether F40 is zero or non-zero, but I'm not interested in that. I'm just looking at the bunch of equations, which depends only on T1 and T2. And then, and then like, 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 like taking fish, fishes, I'm just fishing. And I just, by, just by, by luck, by pleasure, I say, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, etc. And I, and, and, and I get many, many coefficients to be zero. And if I look at the combinatorics, I realize that these are all the FGK where k is at least equal to one. So this means that all the Taylor coefficients, when there is one power of y, at least, they are vanishing. So it remains only f five zero x power five over one uh, factorial of five, okay? And then an easy induction tells me that all this f i g are zero when g is a, 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 at least one, okay? And this is done. And lastly, I say, that it can be verified that affine homogeneity of, in R3 of the cylindrical surface U equal F of X is equivalent to affine homogeneity of the curve. And I said that I don't want to plug in the, the, the classification of, of curve affine classification in this problem just to save time. So now this is just one branch of the tree which is finished, which is the easiest one. But I said I wanted to do something very elementary, do something very elementary, but I showed you. So what I just showed you, this T1, T2 uh, transitivity parameters is something completely universal. I saw it in many, many other structures and I played with it. So now we are looking at the other branch, F21 non-zero. So now this is a coordinate independent hypothesis because we recall that G21 and F21 are non-zero multiple of each other. And we recall that A11 and A22, in fact, there is a misprint here, it should, it should, and also a misprint here, I'm sorry. Should, uh, they are non-zero because this determinant should be non-zero because it is a subgroup of GL3, et cetera. So now, since I assume that F21 is non-zero, G21 is non-zero, and then A11 squared disappears. So if I choose A22 equal F21, I can make G21 equal one. And therefore, I normalize to one. And because I said that once I normalize from one side, I can make exactly the same normalize to the other side. So this was the principle. I rename G equal F with F to one equal one, and I renormalize G to one equal one. Therefore, I can assume that the coefficient of X square Y over two is, all, is equal to one, this coefficient here. And also the coefficient of R square over S over two. And now, since I have a normal form completed in order three. I have now, like in Cartan's method, express the group reduction. So I say that stabilization of these order three normalizations holds if and only if, look, A to two here becomes red equal to one and B1 here because becomes red minus A11, A, A12. And to prove this lemma, we just e examine e FG at order three. We obtain this, okay? Once we have normalized uh, this Taylor coefficients G21 and F21 to be one, it remains the same equation in which you replace F21 equal one and G21 equal one. And these are these equation. And just you realize that here, for instance, the second equation means that it can be satisfied if F22 equal one. I don't want to comment much on the fact that in principle at this level, 
you can also express the discrete group uh, because there is a finite group usually because there are some powers. So as Misha said during his Greek lectures, he said that this method also enables you to treat equivalence under finite or discrete groups, which is perfectly true. But when he said this in Greek lecture, I did not understand much at that time. And in the meantime, I could understand what he was saying. But today I will do everything modulo discrete group because I want just to emphasize a few aspects, not, not treat too many things. So now we pass to order four. So we let all order four monomials appear and there are some order four monomials which are underlined. And I say that you can find their values from the constant Hessian rank one assumption. You plug this in the Hessian, you solve, and you realize that they have, they have these values. Okay, so I skip the details. Okay, so I just explained that the Hessian equals zero means Fyy is Fxy square of Fxx. And you differentiate and you replace. This is was done by Chen Merker uh, recently. And we explained this very well. But at that time, my point of view was not to find homogeneous models, to find, uh, to understand the algebras of different chain variants with the recurrence relations. But today I'm doing something uh, less ambitious in a sense, because in principle, uh, the, the, the universe of different chain variants is much wider. But if you just want to capture homogeneous models, you will have much less freedom in the Taylor coefficient. But I don't want to, to enter too much this, so I skip. Next lemma. So here you have f for 0, f31, which are essentially two Taylor coefficients at order 4. And these are the, what I call the dependent Taylor coefficients which come from the Asian identical zero. So the next lemma is that this Taylor coefficient f for zero or this Taylor coefficient f g for zero, you can always kill it, normalize to zero. And it is also the same game. You look at ek fg, you have still a free parameter b2, look, remember, because b2 is in, in black. So it means that it is still free. Everything is in red is, is already consumed, okay? We ask Maple to compute this uh, uh, FG and to take the Taylor coefficient of X power four. It is now slightly more complicated, but it's not so complicated. It's just, you can do it. There is B2, which is three, which is multiplied by A11 square, which is non-zero. So you can assign G40 to be zero. So in, uh, uh, provided that you kill everything remaining thanks to B2. And then you, you, you restart with F40 also equal to zero and G2, G40 also equal to zero. Also by fun, there is a equation which is uh, showing you that G31 is a relative invariant. By the way, just little comment, there is power two here and power three here. So it's not the same power of A11. So it is a relative invariant. It's not the absolute invariant. So we can say that we have still an equivalent. So sorry, it was just a bit dropped here. So it is F31 X cube Y over six. And as I said, remember there was this X square Y square over two here, okay? So I copy it. And now, once I have normalized F40 zero equals zero, thanks to B2, I should express the stability group. So this means that the parameter B2, which was in the group here, the parameter B2 here should be like fixed, assigned to be uh, sure that you stabilize the normalization. And this is this lemma. Stabilization of this order less than four normalization holds if and only if the group at order three reduces to this group of order four when the B2 in black becomes all this, which is a bit complicated, okay? And the proof is absolutely immediate. As I said, once you have normalized on both sides G40, and F40, 
we come back to this equation in which this term, sorry, this term, uh, this term disappears, this term disappears, and then you have to choose B2 to kill all what remains, which is this. The two terms here are these terms, and this is finished for this order four terms. But when I was doing this, I was not playing simultaneously with the vector field style, which I do when I do play on Maple. Now in the paper, I just like jump a bit from, from order to order. So now I am coming back to order three, but in the infinitesimal counterpart of FG, which is what I call L. So this L, the coefficient of X cube is this. So remember, it, at order three, we had solved B1, if you remember well. So B1, I said that stabilization at order three means that you solve B1 here, B1. So at the infinitesimal level, you should solve capital B1. You should solve capital B1. So you solve it from the equation three zero. So you assign B1 to be equal minus all this, okay? Similarly, A22 was normalized at order three. Remember, little A22, here I said A22 equal one, remember, A22 in the center was equal to one in red. And therefore, there is a complete parallel at the infinitesimal level which means that capital B1 and capital A22 should be solved with this. And now, as I said, going now to order three, because what I'm just saying was at order C, I, I was late. I should have done this a bit before in principle, but in the, in, in the presentation, I somehow did it intentionally not to do it at the right place. Anyway. On, on, the, on the computer, I do it always step by step in a very systematic way to lose nothing. Now, F31 is a relative invariant, as I said. Therefore, I should open a branch. And I will start with the branch F31 equals zero. And I will let, let as I already said, all the five terms appear. And now I have a lemma that in the branch F31 equals zero, I find homogeneity forces F41 equals zero, necessary. And the proof is not difficult. Now I look at L at order four, and one of the two equations looks like this. It's something for times T1, so there should be never any relation between T1 and T2, which are transitivity parameters, like T, like transitivity. So necessarily F41 must be zero, otherwise it's just finished, uh, I'm just wrong. And now I, I solve B2 to be this. And because I, has, I, has, I have said that F41 equals zero, I say minus zero here. And it's logical, it's coherent, because look, if you come back to what I said at the level of EK FG, I said that uh, from order three to order four, only B2 should be normalized, little B2. And here at the infinitesimal level, capital B2 is, uh, is uh, uh, solved. Okay. And so now in this branch F31 equal zero, I deduce that F41 equals zero by this lemma and by just symmetry, as I said, by the principle, similarly, G41 is equal to zero. And therefore, it remains only F50 to the 5 and G50 to the 5. The plus 0 is about the F41. And this is among dependent x square y cube is among dependent jets. It was about what I said underlined. Uh, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's on the 5 already. So maybe I skipped explaining this in this file. We, oui, yes, yes, yes. I skipped writing that this is something that you obtain from the Hessian. I skipped it. Uh, I'm just cheating a bit. Okay, so now, if you next look at FG at order mu equal five, 
you will see on the computer that there is only one equation, this one. And now it tells you that G5, G50 is a relative invariant. And now, once again, there is some branching. So remember the, the figure here. We have the figure. We are here, and we are creating a branching again. So it is a branching here. So now we first study the sub-branch F50 equals 0. So now 0 for F50, 0 for F41, and this dependent monomial here, which comes from Hessian identically 0. And the, the equation V equals G is of the similar form. So now at order 4, the isotropy group is still two-dimensional with parameters A11 and A21. And now comes another proposition of the same uh, kind. So we are in, in such a branch that F21 is non-zero. Usually when some invariance is non-zero, there is no big deal, not big difficulty, because if something is non-zero, you can normalize some group parameter and everything goes smoothly. The thing which in my opinion was the most, most by far most difficult thing to succeed to do something tractable computationally was to be able to explore consequences that these differential invariants vanish. For instance, the F50 in the paper joined with Zhang Chi Chen on parabolic surfaces published in Dissertationes Mathematicae in, in Warsaw, we computed it parametrically. And as far as I remember, the numerator, it has 59 monomials. So it's about one half of page to type. So in this case, if I do want to say, I compute it parametrically, and then I differentiate it to get the consequences. Even on a big computer, when you go to order nine, for instance, I think you will be stuck. So I repeat myself. So today, at least, I would have been able to, to say something to you, which is like uh, something which I consider to be uh, a key point of my uh, understanding of the subject, which I understood one year and a half ago. And I was like thinking for months and months about this difficulty, how to like continue to handle computations when some invariant vanishes identically without being blocked by the complexity. And the, the, the answer is what I already told you in the baby case of F21 equals zero. You just play with the EK L, the infinitesimal transformation equation EK, EK, EK FG, but just epsilon close to the identity. And now in this case, it, it gives you this proposition in the branch F21 on zero and two invariants vanish. If the surfaces are finally homogeneous, then all fgk equals zero except f2k, which is factorial of k, for k equal one, two, three, four, five, etc. So I will get it just easily, this consequence. And how? I go to the computer with a very little program, examine xl at order five, and I just collect the nice equations. What are the nice equations? The equations where there is only T1 and T2. And by luck, here, there are only equations with T1 and T2. So by the principle that everything which is a linear relation between T1 and T2 should be identically 0, I deduce that F06 is 0, F15 is 0, F15 is 0 repetition, F24 is 24, which is factorial of 4. F2k factorial of k. This is just a repetition of what I just got for, for F24. This is F33 equals zero, repetition, F42, etc. So I summarize F24 equal factorial of four, while, while the others are zero. Next, once this is done, I go to order six. I ask Maple to compute me this L at order six to extract all the coefficients. And again, by luck, I have only equation with only T1 and T2. And therefore, I deduce a lot of information about Taylor coefficients. 
And this principle is absolutely universal. I mentioned last time in Greek lecture two, the work of Julien Ed, my current PhD student, who was able to redo the Cameron and Sue classification of homogeneous model for fiber preserving transformations using this power series of method, method of equivalence. I, I, must, I must say that in December or no, no, it was in January 2021, I did it in three days only with this method. Redo everything, all the branches of Sue and Cameron in three days. Although I'm completely unable to redo what they've done with Cartan's method. This would take me three months at least. So the method is, as far as I manipulated both methods, much more efficient than Cartan's method because it is weaker than Cartan. It's much weaker because it does not construct a bundle. It just look at the values of the origin. So you get much less uh, from the point of view of differential invariance, you get much less than over on Cartan or Lee on, on Cartan. Of course, I know that it's, 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 too, it's, too, it's too weak in a sense, but the weakness gives you some strength to reach the homogeneous models in a quicker way with much less computations. So now again, a lot of coefficients vanish except F25, and then I claim that the induction can be written by hand. And I don't do it because it's elementary. And then because I said that F2K is factorial of K, remember that I should divide by factorial of two factorial of K because it's X square Y K divided by factorial of two factorial of K. So factorial of K divided by factorial of K is equal to one and there, is, there remains one over factorial of two. And therefore you realize that in this branch, this is in fact the maximally homogeneous model with two dimensional isotropy. If you, once you have normalized all the coefficient of the vector field, you can, uh, 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 you can just print the values of the vector field because you have uh, two transitivity parameters, T1 and T2, you have two uh, vector fields which are like essentially horizontal. And because four mi by minus two is equal to two, you have two, two isotropy vector fields, you get them, you verify that it is a Lie algebra, you can even, which I did not spend time about this because it is well known, uh, uh, that, uh, know the structure. So now maybe I look at time because I spoke yeah. too much, I think. I think, I think we should end some, sometime soon. I, I don't see the time when I speak. So I, I, I propose to stop now, just okay. one phrase. In the, in the branch F50 non zero, you play with something similar in a sense. Okay, so this is written, but I prefer to stop because I, I spent time to like make it clear. So it was elementary. I think you understood almost what I said uh, very easily. Okay. Okay, thank so you I'm very stopping. much thank for you your for talk. Uh, now, are there any questions or um, comments? Uh, uh, John, uh, let me see you that uh, I like very much uh, all your three lectures, and of course, I share your enthusiasm about uh, the way you are using it. You have many uh, questions which I would like to discuss with you when we meet physically, I hope very much. But uh, now I would like to ask two questions uh, which uh, could be of some interest, uh, not only for me, but for other um, listeners uh, too. So the first question, why, why, you, why you do not linear, from the beginning, why you do not linearize the action of the group of a fine transformation? And uh, you could do it and to write down uh, simple uh, equation for infinitesimal symmetries and after that, I start for, to compute uh, the algebra of infinitesimal symmetry. It seems that it's exactly what you are doing. Uh, it's exactly uh, what I'm doing, in fact, in a sense. Exactly I did not what you are doing, but, you, uh, but you did not pronounce this words. Uh, this I word. say, no, 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 you're true. But what I can like be more specific. Because this I did not geometrize with you. In principle, from L, what I call L, the equation I wrote, you can. There, I have some translation in terms of the infinitesimal action on the jet bundle 
on the on, on the fiber of yeah, the jet yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is yeah. what you say. I know this, but I did not express it today. Uh, you're true. Yeah. Uh, second question is not a question, but uh, uh, but I uh, would like to uh, listening to your talk. I would like to propose uh, a related program uh, which could be some fun. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for people. The same thing, the same surface uh, uh, applied transformation, but the surface uh, uh, is given by equation f of x comma y comma u is equal to zero, and it is allowed to, uh, to be singular at some uh -huh. uh, points. Uh, of, course, uh, of course, you are allowed to multiply this uh, function by non vanishing function with the same equation. And of course, you cannot speak about uh, homogeneity uh, in usual cells because you have singular points. But if we have, say, isolated singularity at zero, uh, so you can uh, distinguish uh, uh, surfaces uh, which are homogeneous if we pink out without the, the origin. And then, uh, for example, I think that. Uh, uh, the hyperboloid u squared minus x squared minus y squared uh, is homogeneous at all points uh, except the origin, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, a very good yeah. question. I've never touched this, but I, I know there is in the literature. I, I found some articles two years ago yeah. of singularity people, especially for surfaces in, in C4, I think. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's known uh, because, you know, uh, then uh, there is some, um, no, we can distinguish cases where there is big, uh, maximally big symmetry uh, group, uh, and then it's uh, interesting what happens with these symmetries when we approach a singular point. So probably some of them blow up, yeah, yeah, yeah. and some of them, and some of them do not, and there could be some uh, interesting things. These are very interesting questions. I did not touch yet such questions. I, 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 I recognize it. Well, and finally, so at the moment, maybe not much more symmetrical, but about uh, political correctness. Uh, uh, so my experience shows that you should be uh, careful, politically corrected, uh, pronouncing uh, uh, method of equivalence, because most people know it as method of equivalence as of Cartan method of equivalence. Uh, I played of course, the lot. Of course, of course, if the group of transformation is finite dimensional, like in the case of your last lecture, today's lecture, then it's the same, uh, the same thing. So methods are uh, the same, uh, but uh, the difference uh, starts uh, when uh, we have infinite dimensional group of transformation. Yeah. I played a lot with this, uh, Misha, because I, I, I decided today to, to do something extremely elementary. But for instance, uh, one, one year and a half ago, I played my, a... My personal solution of this really conservation solution of mass plots is to say uh, your way is I was politically correct. I compare the strength of the two methods. No, no, but it is just, I'm, not, I'm not always very politically correct. This, this is true. I, I recognize. But it's, it's a bit of, it would not be the first time I recognize. So. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, Adam, more questions? I, I would have a question to Boris if he's listening to me because B Boris? Yes, I do. Sure. And thanks a lot for your talk. That's really, oh, I, uh, I do enjoy it. I did enjoy it. <laughs> uh, you're muted now, Jill. Uh, so, uh, so my question, 
I exchanged an email with Dennis that about these two, three, five distributions because he posted a, a paper on Archive recently. Yep. And I asked him whether simply transitive such structure was classified. Oh yeah. Uh, it's been uh, classified in the P in the master thesis of my student, but mm -hmm. it's still available only uh, in Russian in this form. I did distribute a short summary some time ago between those mm -hmm. who were interested, but uh, well, if you are interested, I can also submit, uh, send you a short summary of the classification results. I would be interested just for curiosity because I looked at the paper of Dennis and I wonder whether it was done or not because it does not tell us about this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, not at all. It's in my plans to do the translation in English and probably put it to a hive or maybe publish somewhere, but uh, unfortunately it takes time. Mm -hmm. Just one comment about the method I, I practice in other contexts. This is what just very elementary example, but in some other contexts, the simply transitive case was easier than the multiply transitive case. That's what I am asking this question because I observed, for instance, when I dealt with surfaces in C4 instead mm -hmm. of C3, I could do almost everything except one branch because I don't know, I have a vector field in R4 or C4 and to find a transversal is not so obvious for me, but more than 80% of the tree is done. And I observed that the simply transitive cases were easier than the multiple, but were not so difficult with this method, because at some point when you have normalized all the, the, the isotropy, there remains no anymore A11, B1, B2, as I said, there is only T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, or instead in five dimensional. And then all the equation you, you, you get after some point, they are always linear in T1, T2, T3, T4, T5. And then you, you, you get the consequences with like naturally. So paradoxically, it was in some cases easier, the, the simple transitive case. But do you do you still do you, do you mean still uh, the classification for hypersurfaces of rank one? Not only there, for instance, surfaces in C4, only in the case of uh, CR manifolds of dimension five. I played with this a bit, not with complete uh, trees, but uh -huh. this was a bit paradoxical because we we exchanged about this simple transitive case, which was like with this approach with carton bundle, it was like not so easy to continue with this approach. And with this uh, power series approach, I, I observed that it was like uh, natural and not so difficult. That was- That's, uh, that's an interesting yeah. phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, it would be interesting to see this, uh, how it works. Because to me, a simply transitive case uh, is, is always the most complicated. But well, that's what I wanted to point. Tell you because, uh, yeah. maybe maybe we can like share something in, sure. in the next Absolutely. time because what is it simple uh, transitivity? It's the number of symmetries is the same as the dimension of uh, hypersurface in this case. So, like for example, here simple transitive means that the symmetry algebra is exactly two dimensional. Yes, yeah. No stabilizer. No stabilizer. Identity. So it's like minimal possible dimension of a symmetry uh, under the assumption of transitivity. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I, I also know Okay, okay, very good. So thank you again, Joel, for the talk, and maybe we can we can stop the meeting.